this is what we do, like game on. I was the knuckle dragon jock grunt. It extended beyond just me as a Green Beret or as a soldier. I was learning how to be a better man. Hard work, sacrifice, discipline, dedication. Like these tenets are drilled into your brain literally from day one. Being shot in the face probably in the first five minutes of the firefight. You know, 25 to 30 minutes of laying there, bleeding out, waiting very patiently. <laughs> Uh, Cause what else are you gonna do? For my career, I had switched from wearing body armor and night vision and kicking doors in over to wearing business casual, flying business class and not working inside the theaters of war. Here are my lessons learned from being the bad guy, from being the predator. Think about our minds. How often do our minds pin us down? How often do our minds overwhelm us with negative information? Human mind is the most dangerous battlefield you'll ever be on. If you're like me, if you're like most entrepreneurs, you don't wake up every day ready to crush it. I mean, some days you do, right? Some days you feel amazing. And then other days you're like, what the hell am I doing? And that fluctuation between feeling like a total rock star, like you can take on the world, like a champion and questioning, what are you doing? You are an idiot. How could I possibly think this was a good idea? That difference is costing you. And so when I started interviewing people for my podcast and I started having the chance to connect with some of the world's toughest, most badass warriors. And you know what? You know what shocked me? They all said the same thing. They are no different than you or I. They just look at the world differently. They have different training. And frankly, they're willing to do some pretty badass things. And so in this video, we've stitched together the greatest lessons that I've learned from Navy SEALs, Air Force pilots, and Marines, so you can develop a warrior mindset. First up, Jason Redman, a Navy SEAL who was wounded in combat and had to spend years in recovery. We do hard things. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's the name of your podcast, and that really is the essence of the SEAL teams. We do hard things, we do dangerous things. I mean, whether it's in training or combat, the job that we do has a level of risk and you have to accept those risks. Now we do everything we can to minimize those risks and then life is no different. Um, there's a lot of people who are super risk averse. So they won't, how they avoid risk is they just don't, they don't take risks. Uh, but the problem is without risk, you don't get the reward. So whether it's in business or whether it's in life, whether it's in, you know, adventurous things you do, or in this case, it's being a SEAL, um, there's a tremendous reward that comes with being a SEAL. You get to be a part of an amazing team. You are, I mean, it's hard to believe at times that uh, I got paid to do what I did. I mean, you know, people pay a lot of money to do the things that we did. I got paid to jump out of airplanes. I got paid to blow things up. I got to use amazing equipment and technology and, and gear and you know, travel all over the world to some of the most incredible places. Um, but obviously, there is a level of risk that comes with that. You know, jumping out of airplanes can be dangerous if something goes wrong. Um, diving, you know, <clears throat> um, underneath gigantic ships in the dead of the night. Um, if something goes wrong, there is a risk that comes with that. Um, shooting bullets within inches of your buddy's head when you're doing close quarters combat has a level of risk. Uh, and unfortunately, when things go wrong, whether it's training or combat, people can get injured or killed. Uh, combat obviously gets more complex because you have one outlier that you can't control, and that is the enemy. And we have a saying in the SEAL teams, when you go into combat, the enemy always has a boat. So no matter what plan you make, the enemy has a boat. And you don't necessarily know what his boat is going to be. Um, you can plan based on what you've seen, no different than in life and in business. We do projections, we base things off past experiences, and then we build our plan around that. Well, combat is no different. And the night that I got wounded, um, <clears throat> we, had a, um, we had a scenario unfold. We took down one target. And nothing happened on the first target we took down, um, but we saw a lot of activity on another house about 150 yards away. And we saw some individuals run out from that house, um, which frequently can happen if they're trying to evade us. 
Um, obviously, we have some pretty good technology. So we saw them come out of this house. We saw them run and hide. Well, I took my team and we maneuvered on these individuals. Um, and they had a boat <laughs> and their boat was, Hey, we're going to set up an ambush line ahead of time. Um, which we did not know. These were the factors. We did not know that the individuals we saw come out of that house were the last part of this ambush line and the uh, last part of a very large, well-trained security detail for the number one, uh, Al Qaeda leader we were going after. And when we saw these, you know, four or five individuals come out of this house, we just thought, oh, well, they're just running and hiding in this vegetation. But what we didn't know is they had built a very well-established ambush line and they were last part of this large ambush formation. And we walked right into their ambush. And uh, that's how I found myself and my teammates uh, on the wrong end of actually not just one, but two machine guns and multiple AK-47 shooters uh, without really any cover, uh, cover being something that will stop bullets. Yeah. So brick wall, concrete wall. Um, the only cover we ended up having back behind me was a large John Deere style tractor tire. And uh, my teammates fell back to that. There was also one tree uh, that one of our guys was behind. <clears throat> and uh, and that is how this gunfight played out. Uh, I was out front at first and just got stitched across the body, uh, took rounds in the body armor. I took two uh, rounds in the left elbow. So totally destroyed my my elbow, which I, I didn't know it at the time. I actually thought my arm had been shot off, but thankfully it was still attached. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was in a pretty bad situation. I was taking a yeah. lot of gunfire. I took rounds, uh, like I said, body armor, uh, took rounds off my helmet, rounds off my gun, uh, rounds off my right side plate. And then I turned to try and move back. And that's when I caught a round in the face. It caught me right in front of the ear, traveled through my face, exited the right side of my nose, blew out my right cheekbone, which broke and kicked out to the right. The bullet traveled right under my eye. It vaporized the orbital floor, it broke all the bones above the eye, shattered the head of my jaw, shattered my jaw to my chin and, and knocked me out. So when it hit me, the guys saw me fall and they thought I was dead. But it's, it's not enough. You then have to lie there waiting to be recovered for a long time. Yeah, we estimate the firefight was about 40 minutes. I was shot in the face probably in the first five minutes of the firefight. Um, we don't know how long I was unconscious, probably five to 10 minutes. So, so probably a period of anywhere from, you know, 25 to 30 minutes of laying there um, bleeding out and um, waiting very patiently because <laughs> uh, what else are you going to do uh, for my teammates to, to, you know, win the fight. And, um, you know, during moles and fire, my team leader came forward and got me saved by life, got a tourniquet on my arm and then um, uh, packed some of my facial wound and got us ready, um, you know, continued to direct the firefight. Guys were continuing to shoot. We ended up calling in what's called a fire mission. So meaning we have an aircraft overhead that fires rounds down onto the ground. A lot of people are familiar. It's called an AC-130 gunship and uh, probably one of the most amazing platforms for saving the lives of guys on the ground. Our fire mission that night was the closest fire mission in the entire Iraq war. So we literally called rounds in directly on our position. We're going to break down part of, of your new book, uh, Overcome. And, and the reason for that is because what we're speaking about right now, this, this ambush, you have been able to create what for me is an amazing illustration of the way life sometimes has a way of kicking us and surprising us. I'm sure there's a lot of you listening to this that listen to the story of that, you know, this devastating machine gun ambush. And you're like, holy shit, man, I can't relate to that. And, you know, the, I like to tell people you actually can't. Um, and here's the reasons why. I, you know, obviously, thank you. Thanks to my teammates and the Air Force AC-130 gunship that saved our lives, survived a pretty vicious enemy ambush. And, and you heard about the bullets and bombs that we encountered on the battlefield. 
But the reality is when you encounter a life ambush, you're being hit by the bullets and bombs of life. The major crisis in your business, uh, you've suddenly been diagnosed with a major disease, you lose a loved one, sexual trauma, any of these things, you are being hit by the bullets and bombs of life. So it's not you're not, you know, it's not like you're literally being shot or blown up, but your life and everything that goes on it in, on in it is being shot and blown up. And the interesting thing is, if I was to hook you up to all these medical devices that measured heart rate and respirations and brainwave activity and all these different things, and and I was also hooked up to that during my firefight, uh, we would look almost identical in a major crisis because the human body doesn't have a, oh my God, firefight level. It just has fight or flight. It just has, let me inject cortisol and stress and uh, you know all these different chemicals into your body because we are in a major crisis. So if you understand that, then really the reality is how do we deal with these things when they come? And also accepting the fact that they are coming. That's one of the big things I talk about with life ambushes. Um, and, and let me take one more step back. There are levels of life ambushes. And I think this is another really important thing to talk about. You know, if you look at what happened in my gunfighter, if you look at some of the things that you talked about, ma major sickness or something like that, I, I call those major life ambushes. Those are those are the big ones. And these are the ones that will forever leave um, physical. You know, I, I, I got all these physical scars that will never go away. Uh, physical, mental. So we have the mental trauma that comes with significant bad events, emotional or deep financial scars. And usually it's a combination of multiple that come together to make major life ambushes. Um, they, those scars never heal. Um, right now, those of you that are listening, you can probably think back to a moment that occurred in your life. It could be childhood trauma. It could be sexual trauma. It could be a divorce. It could be the loss of a loved one. Some of the highest ones I've ever seen are the loss of a child. Uh, that pain will always be with you. You will always feel it. You will think back and it just, it hurts um, because they're majors, they're majors. And you will always think back on them. So those are the majors. The good news with majors is the average person will only encounter five on average. Now I know people that have encountered <laughs> good 10. news, good news in your lifetime. On average, you're only going to have five times that life tries to kick the shit out of you. Yes. Majors, the majors. And uh, still a lot, man. it is. And then they are painful. They are painful. Um, but if you have a mindset of readiness, what I call the overcome mindset, uh, and, and what I talk about in overcome, how do we balance? How do we lead ourselves? Then you're better prepared for them when they come. If you live a life that, oh, that'll never happen to me, you're in trouble because when they come, it will rock your world. The second level is a, a lesser level of life ambush. It's what I call a scheduled disruption. And it's something that comes along. It is a major. Um, I'll be honest, COVID for a lot of people had different impacts. For some people, it was just a scheduled disruption. For others, it actually turned into a major life ambush because they saw the loss of their business or sickness or the loss of a loved one. So COVID kind of operated in two levels. Um, but for the most part, uh, a scheduled disruption is something just occurs that knocks you off your schedule. Um, what I see, though, is a lot of people have these things happen and they allow it to impact them for much longer than it should, uh, because you allow it to negatively impact you. You allow it to negatively impact your work, your the people around you. Um, it becomes an excuse not to get things done. And then the, the last one of, of life ambush, I call it a micro ambush. And, and I'll be honest, they're actually the most dangerous. I've seen more people die from a micro ambush. Um, not not physically die, but mentally and emotionally die from a micro ambush. It is the it is that little voice in your head that tells you you are not good enough. You are not fast enough. You're not a good enough leader. You'll never be able to do this. You're the wrong race, creed, color, gender, gender persuasion, whatever it is. That voice that tells you you're a victim, uh, that you'll never be a victor. Why bother getting up? Why bother losing that weight? Why bother starting that business? You want to have you want to have money. You came from a poor family. You don't deserve money. Those are micro ambushes. Those are ambushes of the mind. And I watch more people lay down on the X, and we're going to talk about what the X is, and die. 
mentally, yeah. emotionally, and financially um, because they buy into that lie. It takes a lot of effort to fight back from a very well executed ambush, but it's no different. Make you know, think about our minds. How often do our minds pin us down? How often do our minds overwhelm us with negative information? You know, I the, the human mind is the most dangerous battlefield you'll ever be on. Next up, we got Errol Dobler, a Navy SEAL, uh, ex FBI negotiator <laughs> who talks about how to plan to get through some of life's biggest ambushes. Let's just pretend this is our coaching call. This is, this is my first assessment. The behavior you need is prioritize and execute. Okay, execute to completion. I like to say prioritize and execute is kind of a Navy SEAL ethos and probably combat ethos um, because it's just when you get ambushed, okay, there's a lot of things happening, right? Your teammates are getting shot injured, killed, and the bad guy's got the drop on you and shooting at you. Those are two situations at play. You can't take care of both of them at the same time, right? You just can't. Because if you go save your teammates first, more people are going to get shot, okay? You have to prioritize what's first. I have to suppress that enemy fire, get control of it. Then I can go to my teammates. That's part of the planning process. But so uh, when we use combat examples, I use them because it's the ultimate expression of consequence. If you don't do it correctly in combat, the ultimate consequence, right? Injury, death, mission failure, all unacceptable. So if in those situations we can prioritize and execute, I think in our personal life, we can give it a shot, right? We can try, okay? But only when we recognize it. So what's happening? You're going from... Um, my process, I came to find out, that's why the science, process, art, and science does follow the same process that the brain uses to rewire itself, okay? And I didn't, I came on that later, you know, as I studied the brain. Here's a stat for you. We have between 60 and 70,000 thoughts per day. 80 to 90% of them are the same as the day before. And for the majority of people, 70% of those thoughts are related to the emotions of stress. That's think about that. Now that's, that's, you know, those are studies. Okay. Those are not my, obviously my, my stats. What does that mean for us? That means that something happened yesterday, last week, 10 years ago, whatever it is, right. I, I know some of your, your backstory, right. And we have now thought about that over and over. We think about how that makes us feel. There's an emotion based on it. it made me feel worthless. It made me feel less than it made me feel these things. Okay. And we keep thinking about it. Now we know from science, uh, neuroplasticity, the study of, 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 of neuroscience, when we have an emotion. It literally sends a chemical to the body. Okay. Mind body connection, no longer hippie propaganda, right? It's science. We know that now that is a real thing. I have an emotion, sends a chemical to the body. I feel that. Now, the more we think about that emotion or, or the event that caused that emotion, the more we get the emotion, then we start to become neurochemically addicted to it. All right. So we're going to, we can already, we're already thinking now. We're thinking now based on what we thought yesterday and the day before, because we are looking for anything in our environment to satisfy the addiction to that emotion. Hmm. I can't remember what made me feel worthless. So I have to go find something in my environment to, hey, hey, honey, you, you just walked away from me and I wasn't done. Now, ugh, I knew it. I'm no good at talking to you. Addiction satisfied, right? Meanwhile, your, wife, your wife's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't walk away. I'm right here, oh, right? Man. So then we can now already predict how we're going to feel next month based on how we felt back here because we're feeling and thinking and doing the same things over and over again. And then we are wiring our brain that way. Okay. Now the good news is we can rewire it. So what do we do? And, and you even said it before we went into the explanation, you're already thinking, am I going to love this person as much as that person? Are they going to love me as much as oh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Right. And you're already projecting how you're going to feel in the future based on emotions of the past. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Right. The process, the process, the process. Okay. And what does that mean? First of all, You've already got the first step. How is that making me feel? What are my emotions? Now, how am I acting on it? You've already identified it. You don't like it, right? It, it bothers you. Okay, now the hard part. Well, that's a hard part, right? That identity. But you've done that work. You're very, for God's sakes, you're going to have a bunch of people listening to this. You're laying it out there. So you have no problem acknowledging how you're feeling and how you're acting. What you haven't done, what it, 
in this conversation anyway, I haven't heard, what do you want it to be? Okay, what do you want it to be? Mm. And, and that's an important element because I can't, I would never tell somebody, look, here are the, here are the traits of a leader. You need to be courageous, you need to be honest, and you need to be better, whatever it is. And you might be like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I've never told a lie in my life. Why are you telling me? But it's not applicable to you, okay? That's why there's an art to this whole thing, as I say, because it's what's applicable to you based on the hard work you did of being observant of how you feel and how you act. So now you need to become obsessed with that behavior, okay? It needs to be what you're constantly thinking of. Every time there is a situation happening, oh, my daughter just slammed the door. <gasps> wait, wait. What do I want it to be, right? There's a refraction period. You're still, I'm not, we can't tell anybody not to feel what they feel. Okay. But what is the period from when you feel that thing to when you go to how you want to act? Okay. Stop act. Okay. I, this thing happened. I feel this way. I started acting this way. I did this uh, stop. How long does it take me to act how I choose to act? All right. Now the very notion of doing that and being aware of it starts to rewire our brain. Okay. That's it. Being aware of those things that I just talked about starts to rewire our brain. Now, the planning process. You can't hold someone accountable if they don't know what they're supposed to be accountable to. You have problems telling people who work for you, I assume, right, what you want. Mm -hmm. And then I assume that things don't get done in mm -hmm. the fashion you want them to get done or in the Correct. time you want them to get done. And then you, by your own admission, either just forget about it or you take it over yourself. And then that makes you mad because now you're mad that I don't have employees who take initiative and work with autonomy. I, they just wait, sit around and wait for me to do everything. Does that, does it sound familiar, right? Correct. Correct, sir. <laughs> yes, I am correct, sir. Right. Um, so this is why I tell people, look, planning process. Mm -hmm. When you say we will be held accountable to a planning process inside that process. So I'll, I'll briefly go over it. situation. If the acronym is SMAC. It's a straight rip off from the SEAL teams, right? I didn't develop this on my own. I took it, right? This is what we used because this is what we used to achieve victory on the battlefield and keep people alive. So if these elements are good, they're applicable everywhere. We should always consider them. Identify the situation. Set of circumstances dictating a need for action. What does that mean? It means if somebody tells you something and you go, well, what are we doing about that? That, what are we doing about that? You have a situation. It doesn't need to be a problem. It can be a problem, but it can also be an opportunity. If we, if somebody says something and that's your response, you have a situation. Think about how many times companies and families are acting on things they don't need to, okay? Because they haven't identified the situation. Now, if you've identified a situation, something you need to act on, you need to have a mission. What specifically are we going to achieve? This all sounds so simple, but already, I know somebody's sitting there going, we don't do that. We don't identify the situation or the mission. We kind of have a mission, but then it sounds like it's 15 things in one and mm -hmm. right. One mission. That's it. Now you could have several missions underneath the situation. That's fine, but they all need to be broken out separately because underneath each mission, there are going to be actions that need to be taken. Hmm. That's it. Now, if you've got several missions, what do you have to do? You have to go to behavior, prioritize, execute to completion, okay? If you have actions, things that need to accomplish, if you have a mission that needs to be accomplished, you need command. That is not, I command you to do this. That is, who is in charge of what? If you lay are laying out a series of actions and you don't put who's in charge of what, you've just had a new strategy. Your new strategy is hope and assumption. I hope somebody does these things. I assume people should know what to do. And my, I'll just tell a coping assumption have no place in the leadership equation. Why would you hope and assume when you could be clear? Next up, Nick Kumalatos on why purpose is the most important thing. Obviously we've been dealing with talking about the pandemic for years now, but the true pandemic in my opinion and Nick's opinion is weak men. I'm not gonna sit here and say like the men of the forties were like the best generation. Every generation had their issues, right? Every single generation had their issues. But what they did have was they didn't have a ton of excuses and they had a shit ton of grit. They didn't feel sorry for themselves. They got up and they got the job done, whatever that job was at the time. 
And now we're so feeling, but men specifically are so feeling based. And the reality is, and they're so selfish. And the reality is, it's not about them. It's not about you. If you're a husband or a father, it's not about you. That's it. It doesn't matter. I'm tired. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that you're tired, bro. You still got to do the thing. Your kid still needs to father. Your, your wife still needs to be courted. She still needs to be loved and chased and dated and served. And what's wild is if you pull a man's head out of his ass and stop making him feel sorry for himself and get him unfat and get him moving and get him serving his family and his community and get that switch changed. He's like, holy shit, man, I'm happy. My wife's happy. My kids look at me like I'm a freaking superhero. They're like, my life is awesome. And you know what? They're exhausted. They're exhausted all the time. And they're like, I could never be more happy. And there's a reason for that. Purpose over pleasure. You got to think pleasure. Think about it like a drug addict, right? If I have some guy is addicted to a drug. Does he ever hit that drug enough and go, okay, I'm good now. Or is <laughs> no, it just like, there's always the chase for more. There's always the chase for more, right? There's always Ooh. the chase for more. Same with being an alcoholic, same with being addicted to porn. Same with there's, it's a bottomless pit when you seek pleasure in your life. Well, this thing is going to make me happy. When you seek that, it's a bottomless pit. And I've been there, man. I've freaking done it all, man. I've been there. And you know what? It's never enough to fill that black void. It's just a pit of darkness. And no matter how much you put into it, it always wants more. It's a monster. But when we pivot away from pleasure, and we go towards purpose and we go towards service, that's when our heart actually gets fulfilled. That's when we have fulfillment. That's when we find true happiness. And what the reality is, it's not even about us. Time, what drew you to the military? What was it about the Marine Corps? You know I wanted the Marine Corps because it was the hardest. My personality did not serve me well in the military either. <laughs> Just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> that's a whole other story. But nonetheless... It's probably the same personality that's allowed you to do so well as an entrepreneur, right? 100%. The thing that, you know, the thing that yeah. made you so hard at, at being part of the system as a school age kid and then helped you, your greatest strength in military and your greatest weakness is probably yeah. also what's allowed you to be such a great entrepreneur. You're 100% correct. And then we can dive into a little bit of that later. But so I show up to this recruiter who actually lives down the road now. He's retired, but showed up to this recruiter and you know he gives me the whole like, motivation spiel about the Marine Corps and how awesome it is and all your core values and which one's important to you, blah, blah, blah. Phil takes, he's like, okay, now we're done with that. Let's go run your information. Let's get you in. So he goes back, runs my information, comes out and I'll never forget the look on his face. He's like, kid, you ain't ever joining the Marine Corps or the military at all. And you got to keep, this is the late nineties. This is the Clinton era. And he was like, it ain't happening, man. You're too, you're a convicted felon. You got this, you got that, you got a GD. You're not a high, you're a dropout. You know, so this is pre-war. And uh, so he told me, he's like, no, man, go pound sand, get out of here. And that was the worst decision he could ever have done. Like that was the worst and best decision he ever did to me. As soon as he told me, no, my rebellious spirit kicked in and I was like, oh, okay, let me show you one hurdle after the other, but I just would not take no. I would not take no for an answer. Every obstacle they came up with, I defeated. Next up, we got Steven Drum on how hard boot camp really is. So one day early on in training, and I want to say people always ask me like, what was the hardest part of SEAL training? And was it hell week? And to me, it was the first two weeks because the first two weeks they're trying to just quickly get rid of all of the people that are clearly unsuitable. They just don't know it yet, right? <laughs> so, so basically they're not teaching you much. That first like week and a half, it starts Monday morning with what they call a room inspection, which is always the worst day of any SEAL is, is Sunday night, getting ready for your room inspections because you're never gonna pass. You end up, and it ends up just being a complete torture session of the, the flutter kicks, eight count bodybuilders getting wet and sandy. Well, the whole cup and, and all this stuff, and, and people are just dropping like flies. One night I come back to my room, and, and I think there's probably six of us in a room, and 
there were like four or five guys packing their stuff up. Mm. And I'm like, well, well, where are we going? And, and they're like, well, well, this training's not for us. We're out. I'm like, oh, damn. I guess that, that just leaves me all by myself in this room. And the point there is, is that I realized at that point that eventually they're going to have to start teaching us some shit, right? They can't keep hammering us day in and day out. And so the thing that I had going for me is I think, and the thing that I was able to use, because I made a hell of a lot of mistakes as an operator, as a leader, as, as a father, as a husband, is my ability to stop and get some quiet time and reflect and, and detach a little bit emotionally. So many people that quit SEAL training, they're making that emotional decision, right? We all make emotional decisions, but their emotions are clouding their, their, their ability to really think about what they want and, to and they're clouding their ability to make the choice that ultimately going to be in their best interest is going to serve them. And I think for me, my, my ability to detach and reflect and really say, okay, this sucks right now, but let's think ahead. Is this manageable? Yes, it's manageable. Are you going to be better if you keep committing to this, this thing that this behavior, this action that you know is going to serve me? And when the answer is yes, it reinvigorates me. It gives me the energy I need to keep grinding and keep driving forward. And that emotional regulation really, you know, it went on to probably cause me problems throughout my life sometimes. And, and when I could realize I'm going to pivot here, if I may, and say, that for me, one of the big aha moments in my life was realizing that the type of person that I could be on the battlefield, like to make decisions under fire in extreme levels of stress, like I have to be that same exact person. I have to use that exact same process when I am with my family, when I am like trying to model good behavior for my kids, because for whatever reason, I could be this person. I could deal with like crazy stuff going on. But, but like the simplest stuff at home would set me off. And I don't know if it was because I spent so much energy that I just, I just let it all go when I, when I got home. But when I helped create this program for the Navy called Warrior Toughness to create tougher sailors, it was like, look, I, we've got to teach these people how to apply the same techniques in their personal life as we teach them to apply when the bullets are flying, right? When ships are crashing into one another and it's like extreme. We need to be able to use the same psychology techniques, mindfulness meditation techniques, character development. We got to be able to use that and be consistent. When I figured that out in my life and when I started being more consistent, that's really, that's really when I started to be like a better person, a more productive, capable, uh, and just all around person of character when I realized that. And, and I didn't have any of that stuff as a kid, you know, um, I just, but for my uncle, like, I, I feel like I was really starved for like the real mentoring of like, Hey, don't act like that. Don't do that stupid stuff. And my biggest challenge as a leader in the SEAL teams is not like when the bullets were flying, right? It wasn't in those life or death moments. It was when, because that's when SEALs are the happiest. Like, why? You know, what, you, I mean, bullets are flying. You're having the most fun. You're just popping, like, shooting stuff off, or what? Now, I, obviously, you know, when things get really bad, that's a whole different story. But I'm saying generally, SEALs want to go out and kick doors in and mm. get after the bad guys. What they don't want to do is go live in some third world country, getting sick off the food, training some other people to do some fight someday. That's what they don't like doing. But we need them to do that job. We need, for a whole host of reasons, we need them to be that person doing that job. And so it doesn't matter within any organization, you work for the perfect company, right? You love your team, you love your boss. But if we're being totally honest, we're not going to like every decision that that leader makes. We're not going to like every direction that organization decides to take. And so fundamentally, developing the sense of purpose that drives everything, that drives that commitment, it has to be on us. It has to tie back into that personal philosophy, right? And so you have to be the type of person that's willing to put pen to paper to say, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. This is how I show up to the people around me. And so I, I really, as cheesy, as hokey as it sounds, I really encourage people to develop that, to write that who they are. It's like, Hey, for me, for example, like, Hey, I don't crack when things get hard. I work hard to get better every day. And I do for the people to the left and right of me. And, you know, and sometimes I fall short of that, but that has to underpin my sense of purpose. If you have people that cannot connect in a sense of purpose, whether it's sometimes it's only, 
with the people around them. They want to go to work every day because they love their team, right? They may not be enthused with the organization or vice versa, but they've got to find a way to, to connect. They've got to find a way to find purpose, even if it's for their own sense of, uh, sense of pride. Otherwise, you know, the amount that they're going to get, that they're going to give is always going to be limited. Next up, we got Nick Lavery on why people in the military have such high levels of confidence and what we can do to, to grab a little bit of that. I mean, to fast forward through time a little bit, I was ultimately back in 2012, I was in my third time back in Afghanistan and I was wounded three times on three separate occasions on the same deployment. So we were there for six months. First time I took some grenade shrapnel to the back of my shoulder, really wasn't that big of a deal. I was out of the fight for maybe four or five, six days. And then I was just right back to work. And about six weeks after that, was when I was wounded for the second time. I got shot in the face by an AK-47, which sounds a lot worse than it was. It really just grazed me. I got really, really lucky. Ripped my face open. It looked nasty. It bled a lot, but it, you know, literally a flesh wound, as we kind of stereotypically call it. And then towards the very back end of that the same deployment, we only had a couple of weeks left before we were coming home was when I was wounded for the third time. And this one was obviously much more severe. We can certainly get into the nitty gritty, but you know it was an insider attack, meaning a guy that we had been working alongside of, a member of the Afghan National Police Force, opened fire on me and my team with a truck mounted belt fed machine gun from about 20, 25 feet away. And most of the damage to me was to my right leg. It took about four or five rounds, shattered my femur, severed my femoral artery. I ultimately treated myself until some of my teammates got to me. They were able to provide a little extra aid, but really, man, for all intents and purposes, I absolutely 100% should have died that day. And obviously I didn't because I'm here talking to you and, you know, the journey continues from there. I spent a year at Walter Reed. And then once I got back to my unit was when my next major street fight began. And that was with the army who was really trying to have me medically retired and I had to just dig in and refuse to accept that and eventually work myself back to where I'm supposed to be. Whew, there's a lot to unpack there. So how is it that you can be hit with grenade shrapnel and you know, you're out for a few days, but that still must've been scary as hell. You get shot, but a flesh wound, you say it still must be scary as hell. I mean, is this just another day at the office because there was just so much happening or is each one of these little things kind of ticking away and adding another tick of like doubt, another tick of fear, another tick of worry? Like what's this doing to your mindset? What's this doing to your head? Yeah. It's going to sound like some, you know, bravado machismo bullshit, um, which is okay. The truth is we were dropped off into a hornet's nest, me and my teammates. We knew where we were going into. We knew it was going to be a knockdown street fight every day. And it's exactly where we wanted to be. And we got exactly what we asked for. So what's important to keep in mind is that even though I suffered these two injuries prior to the one that really changed the trajectory of my life, in context to the environment we were living in, and in context with what we were doing every single day, it was very marginalized because of the severity of what was going on around us. I had friends and teammates that were being much more severely wounded than myself. I had friends and teammates that were being killed. We were just engrossed in combat. And it's really amazing, man, what the human mind and body can become conditioned to with enough reps and with enough time of any particular environment or any particular task. You know, the first time I jumped out of a plane, it's like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm a land walking mammal. This is the most unnatural thing I could do, but like crazy, right? You do it 250 times and yeah, your heart rate speeds up a little bit. You get that little worry, there's some you know, little anxiety, but it's not nearly the same as it was the first time because you've just done it so many times. <laughs> Being in combat is is just like that, or really just like anything else. And that's the environment that we lived in. So the context in which these things happened to me is a huge aspect of why I was able to say, okay, man, no big deal. Like this is another day at the office because this is what I signed up for. This is what we do. Yeah. This is why you're here. Yeah. Suck it up, get yourself treated, whatever that takes, and then get back to work. 
is there a little bit of I'm a total badass and each time that you get a little scar, it's like it's almost like another notch in the belt of pride of like, you can't stop me. Like, can you turn these things into like, into fuel as well without getting too unhealthy about it? I was able to do that. I think yeah. it, it's certainly a very slippery slope that you're on at that point. It'd be tough because in order for us to do the things that we need to do as Green Berets, as special operations personnel, we have to operate with a extremely high degree of confidence. That's a key word, confidence. If you're going to drop me and 10 of my friends off, we're going to slide down ropes onto a rooftop that we've never been before ever in the middle of the night. And we're going to start kicking down doors, knowing people on the other side with guns in order to even come remotely close to being able to do that. You have to go into it knowing me and my boys are the baddest people in this valley. This is what we do, like game on. Like you have to have that to go do that. Much like football players or any athletes that enter into that type of arena where injury is almost probable. Like to be able to go do that, you have to be operating at a really high degree of confidence. And for me, when I was wounded those two times, it did enable that quite a bit. It was like, okay, yeah. yeah, like this is what I do. Bring it on. Like good luck taking me down. You know, that kind of hype, internal hype that was fueling that confidence. The reason why I say it can get slippery is because it could easily enter into this realm of cockiness or arrogance. Mm. And like the separation between being highly confident and arrogant, I think is probably razor thin. And if you end up in that place of arrogance or this unrealistic superiority complex, then you can forget the fact that you're a human being and there are limitations in which what the body is capable of. So it's a difficult ridge to try to walk. Looking back in retrospect, I feel like, you know, I came pretty close to staying on that razor's edge. Yeah. And the reason I say it is I think most of us are afraid of it. And, you know, my wife is always... I like to do little challenges just to prove that I'm a badass because frankly, most of the time I don't feel like a badass. Mm. Most of the time I feel lazy and weak and scared and afraid and all of those things. And when I tell mm. that to people, either they do two things. They go, Mark, we all feel this way, mm. but no one talks about it. Or people look at me and go, really? And they're a little bit surprised. Mm. So there's only so many cold plunges you can do and runs you can do and pushing yourself. But often when I get hurt or I'm really challenging myself, I try to turn it into, it's like if you're trying to go through a cut, you can either mm -hmm. just be hungry all the time or you can say, ooh, this hunger, this hunger means yes. it's worth it. Who else, yes. who else is going to do this? Who else is capable of, of running a 5K dehydrated on a cut because you're getting ready for photos or whatever it is, right? Like you yeah. can just like, you can like feed it. And because it's not natural to me, I love it. I think more of us should do this. I'm almost not even worried about going too far off the deep end with it because I think naturally my confidence and our self-doubt is so high. Our confidence is so low. We need more of it. We're not built to be these arrogant machines. Mm. And so I think it's interesting that there's a fine line, but I would prescribe that more of us need it. I don't know what mm. you think of that. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree, man. You know, also keep in mind, I would agree with everything you just said. I think that's absolutely brilliant. In my world, we live in the world of extremely hyper type A, hyper competitive <laughs> individuals, right? Which is part of what makes us great. It's also part of what opens up a vulnerability in a lot of different ways. So again, I'm a product of my environment to a large degree. And my experience has shown me that most operate with an extremely high degree of confidence and many do go kind of past that point to the realm of cocky and arrogance. And if you walked up to any single person on the planet for the most part and said, Hey, would it shock you to hear that Navy SEALs are cocky? The answer would probably be like, <laughs> no, like, of course that wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise you. Right. I'm talking some shit about my Navy squid brothers, but you know, it's part of what makes us great, right? You can be a SEAL, you can be a Ranger, you can be anyone in the military, you can be anyone in law enforcement, fire, emergency services. I would rather have you be confident on my side 
than not confident. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's, so it's I give you guys permission. Yeah. <laughs> please, please you have to be have confident it. and arrogant. <laughs> yeah, you do have to have. But I would say generally outside of this tiny, tiny world that I live in, man, it's super small, you know, demographic. Um, I would challenge people to lean into that a bit. And like you said, man, find yourself at these points of doubt and discomfort and struggle lean into that. I realize how hot it is, man. And this is by no means is this easy, but there's absolutely something to be gained by if you can flip that and to see it as an opportunity to grow and get stronger and more capable and more resilient and et cetera, that can become a very dangerous aspect of us. And I see that in a good way where we can really yeah. weaponize who we are. Next up, we got John Foley, the man who flew planes in the movie, the original movie, Top Gun. <laughs> he talks about trust and the four C's. For me, there's what I call the four C's of trust. And I, I came up with these in reflection, back to not just my time in the Navy, but on sports teams and business and in life, right? So here's what I call the four C's. The first is competency. So, you know, are you competent? Is the person you're dealing with, this electrician, you know, are they competent in, in what they do? And, and that's usually pretty easy to determine. I mean, there's lots of ways in this world where um, sometimes they give you a degree, which doesn't mean you're competent at all, but it means you did something, right? Um, uh, it always cracks me up that, you know, uh, how about one day that um, while someone's in med school and they're, they're training to be a doctor, uh, they can't operate on you by yourself, but all of a sudden the next day they, they get designated a doctor and they can, right? So it, it's, it, it's interesting, right? But my point is the idea of competency is, is, is the first starting point. And are you surrounded by people who are highly competent? And they need to prove that every day. See, that's not a one-time thing, right? Um, I know I have to prove that every day in my jet, you know, in my competent. Okay, well, so that's easy. Let's not spend too much time there. Um, the next one is commitment way more important to me mm. in trust. All right. You know, uh, are, are you committed? Is the team committed? Is everybody committed? And that can mean different things to different people, right? Some people are just trying to get the job done and move on to something else. Others, when you're on the blue angels, you're 100% in. I mean, the commitment is I'll do anything. You can count on me. It's not somebody else's job. I own it. Right. We'll, we'll come out with the outcome. So commitment is huge. Uh, the third C is character. And, um, you know, this is something that it's it's so fundamental, but it's so important in our, our souls. You know, uh, what's my integrity? What's my character? Uh, if you have a bus there, man, it's just it's time not to deal with those people. Move on. Right. Because character has to be who you are and, you know, yeah. what you do when people aren't looking. Go ahead. But that's an alignment of character. Like, I mean, I can have a ah. character and a set of values and beliefs and so can you, and beautiful. it's not yours are right or right or wrong. It's just, it's just, we're not aligned. Right. No, it's beautiful. That's right. That's a, I call it as a center point exercise for alignment, but you're exactly right. Is what are those core values? Do we agree to those core values? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, you can see right now, you know, in the world, there's a lot of different alignment. There's no, there's not alignment on core values. Right. Um, so the idea of what that is, is important. I agree with you hundred percent. And that's why the culture of an organization is real important so that you're not guessing what are those core values. Um, so I, I agree with you. Yeah. Character, you know, is, is absolutely critical. Uh, and then the last one is consistency. And this is the one that makes or breaks it, hmm. right? Are you consistently, do you bring your A game? You know, when I'm flying 18 inches from another jet, let me tell you, consistency matters. You know, I, I got to know that, 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 you're on your A game. And if you're not, you're going to clear the formation or if there's a problem, right? So I think that's the one that I've noticed mostly in, I would say the business world is that's where the lack is, you know, of consistency of always at the top of your game. Oh, interesting. And, and do you believe that just the machine that is, because I've always been curious as to the type of person who's attracted to a military career, or they find themselves in one. I mean, I'm, you know, I've only been able to ponder that, you know, people find themselves there because they're attracted to it or they believe in honor or for financial reasons or for schooling reasons. There's, there's a reason they become there. And then the military machine puts out people in certain ways. And I found that, that those who are leaders coming out of it, like yourselves, like, like other people I've spoken to, um, they just, I can tell, like they have a framework, they have a way of thinking, they have a way of speaking. It just is there. And so does the military do something to, produce better consistent people and outcomes than this other, you know, world that we live in? 
You know, it's a great observation. I, I asked that of my dad once uh, in a little different way. I said, hey, dad, what was similar and what was different about being highly successful in the military? He commanded brigades and was in you know Thailand and he was a, he was an engineer by the way uh, built roads and stuff um, and the civilian world and here's what he said and it gets right back to what you're saying he says I can show up into any organization within the army he happened to be in the army uh, it could be the infantry artillery you know it doesn't matter um, the Marines the Navy the Air Force uh, I could just show up and everyone's going to fall within a band and he kind of went like this with his hands okay. He said, they may be left or right of that, but I'm going to know where they're going to fall. Hmm. He said, but in the world that I'm in right now, you know, it's out here. And what he really did is he went, it's out here, right? You just don't know. Um, and so I, I think that your observation is, is interestingly accurate. It's yes, there's a culture that you are um, brought into uh, in the military. They're actually slightly different. The Air Force has a different one than the Navy, than the Marines and the Army. Um, but there is a culture and uh, you have to fall within that culture. You can be left or right a little bit, but there's a, there's a culture there. And I think that's also attracts people that want to be part of something larger than, than themselves. That's what mm -hmm. I say. And, uh, and that's what's critical is you need to be part of something larger than yourself. Do you think that that you said that you have to fit in within the culture or else you bounce, but does it take people who do not fit in and turn them into people who do? Are there lessons we can be, that we can learn in terms of consistency and other things like that? Yeah, I think it's both, right? Because people are people. I don't want you to think that, um, you know, everybody's comes out of the military or is in the military, you know, thinks exactly the same way. No, because there is value in diversity of thinking, right? Um, I think the way I'd like to say it is, that in my experience, let's take the extremes. You, uh, you hadn't saw the movie Top Gun, but there's Maverick and Iceman, okay? And I'll just tell it for your audience, as most people have seen the movie know. You know, Maverick was kind of this rogue character. He was pushing the limits and Iceman was this methodical, you know, discipline, um, just ice, right? And those were the characters that Hollywood portrayed. And in Hollywood being Hollywood, usually takes something and, and just makes it extreme, right? The answer is it's usually somewhere in the middle. Okay. Usually somewhere, you know, those characteristics of focus and discipline, you need those, but you also need this characteristic of adaptability, this characteristic of uh, things change. I mean, when I, when I get airborne, you know, I brief a flight, the minute I get airborne, I know that things are going to change mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that. I love change. I love adapting to change. So um, I think that, you know, it, it, while people can be unique and everybody has their own personalities for sure. Um, the idea is, are you focused on the mission? Are you aligned? Back to that word you used. Are you aligned with a, a mission? And I would suggest a mission that's higher than yourself. Hmm. I love that. I love that. Um, and so looking at the four C's for trust, which, is, which isn't something, I mean, I, I've not really come across that before, even to break down. And I know there's a formula for everything, but even to break down <laughs> trust, I love that so much. Now, when there isn't an alignment of character. Yeah, good point when there isn't uh, the commitment, I have found that, that I, I am very uncomfortable just being so black and white of it. Like, like, listen, it's not you, it's not me. It's just, this isn't working or, or, you know, being able to, being able to read within myself, Oh, I'm feeling off about this person because I'm sensing a lack of commitment in them or even reflecting upon myself. Oh, I'm not stepping up and providing the commitment that others need so they can trust me. Uh, how do we go about fixing these things? Yeah, well, good point. I, I think the first thing that you brought up is the awareness, right? And, and the awareness in yourself. And uh, usually it's, it's pretty obvious to the other person. So the, the, the first thing that, that we did on the Blue Angels and, and that I like to teach is what I call a glad to be here debrief. And what that is, is an, it's an environment where we can have these discussions, I call it a safe environment. And we did them all the time. We didn't do it just when there was a problem. In this case, problem with trust, right? Um, we were reinforcing what went well all the time. And we were also identifying, oh, guess what? There's some gaps here and we're working on that. And so I think you need to have an environment that's a safe environment. I'm talking psychological safety, right? Where you can say, I'm upset. 
this isn't working, you know, mm-hmm. things that you're, you're talking about. So to me, that's the tool that allows you to deal with these situations. Now, at some point, um, if people are not going to buy in to the, to the program, then yeah, there's, there's time to, it's time to move on. Right. And, uh, and, and who you surround yourself with matters. So I found the other thing is small things matter. You know, there's this beautiful quote um, and it says, put your faith in the small things because that's where your strength comes from. I think change starts on the inside and then works its way out. So it starts with you. Right. So um, if you are the leader or if it's you know, your company or this situation, um, great, because you have the ability to set the tone. If you're not, that's OK, too. You still can make change. You know, if it's the, the classic, if you want someone to be trustworthy, be trustworthy yourself. And finally, we got Clint Emerson talking about living a rugged life and bonus what to do if there's a zombie apocalypse. The why boils down to the pandemic. Right. So during the pandemic, I had I was driving the country doing combat edition where I was meeting with all of these badasses that are experts in their own little vertical of combatives, you know, shooters, knife throwers, hand to hand guys. And that was, you know, in, but dur- but but when I did it, the highways of America were empty and you were hearing about toilet paper, you know, being, you know, obviously not to be found. And I just thought to myself how strange all this was, right? Like what the fuck is going on around here? So during that drive, I realized, you know, hey, I'm putting together books that allow you to survive, you know, seconds, minutes, hours, and days. But what America and what the globe actually really needs is, no, you just need to know how to have a lifestyle that gives you all the things you need without having to rely on everything else, right? And we've all but, become- but, but why? So when when shit goes down, you're okay or or for the love of it? That, that's what I couldn't figure out. Well, there's two parts. Right? There's multiple parts actually, because as I started to build the book, you start to realize more and more of how important this is. Number one is every American male, female, and kid in this country just 200 years ago knew everything in this book and then some, right? It is what this country was founded on. So there's a little bit of patriotism and going back to our roots built into this. And I think it's important everybody remember that piece because we have come pretty fast, you know, in a very short period of time and now everything is 100% digital and very little is analog, but it is the analog that is going to work for you no matter what happens on this planet, right? And so having a little bit of analog in your life, meaning you're doing stuff with your hands and you're doing it yourself, will only benefit you and it'll benefit you in more ways than you can imagine. But we are into this whole instant gratification type world where You know, I want that food delivered to my front doorstep. The pandemic has made us more lazy, more complacent, because it was all about how do I get everything I need through my phone and delivered to my door, which to me is ridiculous, right? I mean, it just seems so, it's so, it's such a bizarre time we've, we've had the opportunity of living through and That was one of the wake up calls. Like, no, people just that it was just a personal endeavor. Like, hey, no, you need to do it yourself. Stop relying on this whole like delivery system. Yeah. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second because, yeah, sure. I believe in what you're saying and and we'll dig into that. But um, you also kind of sound like the guy or the, or the, or the, the girl who, um, mourns the passing of cursive writing. You know, like like my in-laws bring up all the time that cursive writing is no longer taught in our school systems. And I go, well, that's cool. It's, it's a great skill to have. Yes, letter writing is a great skill as well. But how will that serve our children as they grow up in the digital age? It's, it makes more sense for them yeah. to learn how to type, or, right. you know, or how to spell or grammar or all of these things. So is there a certain amount of like just you know, you're, you're caught up in the romanticism of no, not be? at all. There's, there's one word on the, in the subtitle of this thing, right? Modern. So that's the key takeaway. I'm not saying throw your cell phones out. I'm just saying, no, you can use 
all of your technology to actually be more self-reliant. And I talk about it throughout the book, you know, it, you, how to leverage your phone in a lot of other ways in order to help promote the self-reliance piece. I'm saying cut out your 100% reliance. <laughs> like, it's insane to, you know, every little thing that we do involves a phone. And, but if you want to create an air gap between you and the next virus, between you and the next supply chain issue, between you and all of these different, you know, crises we keep facing, you know, round after round, the air gap is self-reliance, right? So that, oh, okay, that crazy world isn't touching me when it comes to my food or, oh, that crazy world isn't touching me when it comes to having to fix something in my house, right? Just create, you know, it doesn't have to be full on little house on the prairie. Um, I'm not saying that at all, nor would I live that lifestyle. That's, I mean, you know, it's no, let's implement a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, one, because I feel like once people do it, they'll go, oh, I should have been doing this all along. This is great. Like having a window seal garden of basil that I can then pick it and put it into my meal right then and there. How cool is that? But they've forgotten how to do these little things that, you know, support the self-reliance piece that I'm pushing and you can have fun with it. And also it brings the families back together. Right now you got, you know, four and a half people sitting in a living room, all of them on their devices and not paying attention to the TV that's on, <laughs> which is crazy. The TV's on and everybody's sitting there staring at their phones. And, um, but, you know, these, these are projects that even families can kind of start doing together and, you know, mom and dads can start raising their kids with a little bit of hands-on knowledge again, um, because that's I'm what gonna, I grew up I'm, with. I know, I know you grew up in Saudi Arabia and, um, and, and you've kind of been all over the place, but I'm, I yeah. want to push you a little bit more on this too, because again, it's, it's a really great guide. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot, but um, I've also dipped into these types of guys. Like I grew up in a household where I grew up in the city. And then when I was uh, 13 years old, we moved halfway between two little towns mm. on a 70 acre property and we hand built a stack log home. So we built yeah. our own home. You You're know, good. we got the cedar. I spent weeks stripping cedar logs that we cut into 16 inch pieces. <laughs> we mixed mortar the traditional way. We built a stack oh, wow. log home. And then I lived in this, in this house that was, uh, that was only heated through radiant heating, underground radiant heating. That was this, uh, wood burning, huge wood burning thing that we would load twice a day. Uh, and so it was like two hours a day of yeah. pulling out the, uh, the ash, loading it up. Uh, you know, hardwood was always better, you know, cutting everything. We would like, we lived this way and I did that for two or three years. Um, and so maybe I'm a little bit PTSD about it, but you spend <laughs> yeah. so much time, so much time and effort trying to live this way that the entrepreneur side of me goes, who has time for this? So, so I love that we could yeah, yeah. do this. We could yeah. do this, but, but still why write this guide? Why write this book? What do you, what, like, what, why is your heart into this? Well, because no one had a backup plan. No one had anything uh, when when the pandemic occurred and that's so really, really when old. shit goes down when it really goes bad. And I think people are embracing more of the, Oh, I got to do it myself. I think it's slowly starting to kick in, right? That self-reliance piece is starting to become important again, not because it's going to be a primary lifestyle, but because I need to just know how to do this so that when things go bad, I can get through those bad moments without having to rely on other people that aren't, that are not going to be there for you. Right. That's really what it boiled down to. I mean, so, you know, you brought up be your own power grid or be your own heating source, right? That's those chapters aren't about, Hey, do this as a primary thing. It's more like, no, just think about it for a second. A $5,000 generator hooked up to your panel that's out in the garage can go a long way the next time the power goes out, especially here in Texas, where the grid failed catastrophically just one winter ago, and you had people dying and freezing to death, which is crazy in Texas, right? I mean, just, you know, people think of it as just hot all the time here, but it isn't. And so, you know, have that backup plan and that backup plan should be built on 
the foundation of self-reliance, not the backup plan of I'm just going to go ahead and have an Amazon account and Netflix just in case one of those go down. I've still got movies yeah. to watch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so 100 Deadly Skills, Rugged Life, you know, ex-Navy SEAL. Uh, of course, I've got to ask you, uh, zombie apocalypse, what do you do? <laughs> well, first you have to identify out of the 32 different kinds of zombies that I've seen listed. You have to identify which one it is you're dealing with, you know? How do you know, right? There's fast twitch, there's slow twitch. There's the ones that run fast, the ones that run slow. There's the ones that work in hives, you know? Uh, there's some that only come out at night. I mean, but once you identify which one you're dealing with, then you can come up with the proper protocol to deal with it. What would be your plan? What would be, your, <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got two plans. My wife and I talk about this all the time. What would be your go-to plan? Well, there's two plans that you effectively should have. There is the bug in, and then there is the bug out, right? Now, bugging in means that you have basically fortified your current place where you live. You have all the supplies you need, and you can really hunker down and survive. You can sustain life right now with everything you've got for a long period of time. The bug out means, okay, now I've got my bug out bag, my loadouts, I've got everything figured out and sorted that can go into a vehicle. The vehicle has, you know, $3,000 worth of cash inside. It already has all the fuel tanks that are full so that once I start moving, I don't have to stop. And when I do stop, I'm paying cash all the way and there's never going to be any other issue with me getting fuel to get to wherever it is I'm going that, you know, whether that's a, you know, the evacuation route, or it's to your cabin in the mountains where you know you can hold up and be safe. But I mean, so, so you think fuel is actually so this is interesting, because the, the two plans, uh, I live, I live near <laughs> one of the Great Lakes. Yeah. I live about, um, gosh, I've run there. I live uh, three miles from the edge of the Great Lake. Uh, nice. So I've always had two plans. I, I'm surprised you said cash because my plan was to just steal everything. <laughs> I imagine everything's going bananas. So either I go down to one of those uh, fancy uh, uh, marinas and I steal a large boat and then yeah. I hunker down in the middle of a great lake because then, you know, You're no protected. One, yeah. I'm protected and I have fresh water access and, and I can fish and all that stuff. Or I head up north I keep heading north, but I always thought the biggest issue would be uh, congestion and other people freaking out as opposed yeah. to like running out of fuel or food or anything like that. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I agree with everything you just said. I think really, you know, your your level of prep and status and know-how really drives the train on this at the end of the day, you know, like the bug in or bug out, they're, they're, it's two different worlds, but the goal is, you know, really avoiding avoiding all of it. Right. I mean, if I'm going to take a route out of town, I'm not taking the one that's uh, most traveled. I'm going to take the route that's least traveled. Um, you know, if, uh, money, money is great. Probably the first couple of weeks you're going to run out, but people will take your money and money becomes it, it, it until other things begin until we get into a bartering system, which is what's going to happen in a situation like that, or let's go to real world. Like if you're going to talk about, like you look at Russia invading Ukraine, you know, imagine what those people are going through and, the, and realizing, wow, I didn't really have a plan for this. I remember the interviews of Ukrainians before Russia invaded and they thought it was all fake news. Like, no, that's not happening. There's no one at our border. They're doing exercise. They actually believed what Russia was saying. And so did I, you know, I was surprised that probably, you know, most of the European countries also was like, yeah, he's not going to do it, but he did it. And then uh, people were left, you know, they're left stranded and, you know, and then they're forced to figure it out. That's figuring it out when it happens is the wrong time to figure it out as we, as we know. So having a plan goes a long way. And then adjusting it accordingly, you know, obviously being flexible is, is also a great way to look at it too.